Homage to him, the Blessed One. The fully, enlightened. the fully enlightened one, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. So hello, everybody. And I'm, I'm, I'm a happy camper. I just got the air conditioner completely maintenanced. <laughs> and it's been four days of uh, 43 and 44 Celsius. So I looked, uh, was walking around with ice towels around my head, <laughs> trying to manage here. Um, that's always an adventure. There's always an adventure here. It's kind of real interesting. So what we started doing last week, we started to talk about, uh, about the uh, Bojanga Samyutta. And I said, we'll stay with it a little bit. And what we'll do is go through so that you can hear a little more of it, where most the Bojanga, the Bojanga are the seven enlightenment factors. And, and these seven enlightenment factors, they work in a particular way. Let me see if I can do this for you. Actually, I do have a drawing board here. One second. I do. I have a drawing board that works. I tried it the other day. <laughs> Let's see if we can make it work again. Here. I'd have all this out here with the Buddha, did you? <laughs> Except that I'm actually in my room and we had to move a lot of things to fix the air conditioner. <laughs> okay, I think I can do it now. So I want to go to the drawing board with this for just a minute and see if I can do this for you. Um, okay. Ah, it does work. Okay. So now let's try this. Okay. So if I enlarge this board, I have to find out how to do, oops. I'm having fun with this pen. It lets me do lots of stuff, doesn't it? Okay, now we'll go here. Um, And then we'll extend the board here. Here we get, we're getting there. It's a different kind of drawing board piece I have. Okay, we'll leave you there. Okay. Um, so I just want you guys to see how we usually talk about these seven factors this way usually draw the teeter totter like this and then you put a board across it And then we divide the each side of your your teeter totter. You divide it into um, parts like this. Didn't come out quite right, but what you're going to have is um, you're going to have seven, six, seven pieces. Okay. And so the first one is going to be mindfulness, and I'm really very fond of this diagram of this. 
because the mindfulness is the piece that allows you to watch this whole thing. This line is supposed to be straight, but I'm not sure if I can fix that for you. Let me see. Here we go. There. And we go back over here and choose this little guy here. And I should be there again, right? Well, I need a color. Okay, I had a color. <laughs> okay. And, um, Okay, and so the first one is um, investigation. So this one is the investigation. This one is energy. And this one is joy. On the other side of the teeter-totter, okay, on the other side, after joy fades away, remember that tranquility always arises. So this one is tranquility over here. And this one is your level of concentration or collectedness. So this time, maybe we'll say collectedness here. But I, for those of you who have not been here with us before, uh, we always say collectedness instead of concentration so you don't make it too tight. That's why we like that word because you're just collecting your mind so that it's all gentle. It's all very gentle, collecting it so that you can just watch what's happening, okay? And then the next one, the last one is going to be equanimity. And this is where the, the most strong equanimity is going to grow. And now these seven factors are important. And the reason they are important, the reason they're so important is because in order to fall into cessation, you know, when you really are going to experience the opening of mind, and I like to call this like the rebooting of your mind. If you think about a computer, it's that's, or operationally, this is kind of what's happening. You are reaching a level where you're going to give away, not, you're not going to pay any attention anymore to anything that's a thought about the past and you have any reaction or um, restlessness, guilt, or remorse about anything in the past or even anger or a grudge or anything or revenge. You're going to let all that stuff go because it's in the past. And then you're going to let everything go from in the future. You're not going to worry about anything in the future because we say now I understand what the future is. The energy for the future, it's not here yet. And the energy of the past is used up. So this is very common sense. We're going to work in the present time when we're practicing. So if I was to show you a picture of like where we're practicing, let's, let's do this really quick because I see a couple of people here at haven't seen before, so let me just show you this real quick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do is just make a little uh, diagram for you that every we, we've shown a lot of times before, but I'll just do it real quick. Okay. So this is where we teach you very quickly that you're born here and you're going to die here. Congratulations, everybody does. And then you're in the middle, and I'm just gonna make it a bead this time. We're just gonna say it's a bead and it's all going in this direction, okay? And that little bead is actually like a little car and we usually take the time to draw a little car with a trunk. And what people do that is so damaging is that when things happen to you back here, this is the past, back here, this is the future over here. And the one that we really like, um, the one that we really like is uh, this present one here, the present. We make that pink because it's such a great color. It makes you feel so happy. This is P for the present, okay? And that's where we are. We are here in this right here, and we are moving through a life continuum line. So when you're practicing what we're, what we're talking about in this book this time, 
um, instead of having any tension about stuff that happened in the past. And if you look carefully, most people are living 80 to 85% of their life when they respond, they don't respond, they react. They react to things in their life and it builds up a lot of tension. You do it almost subconsciously. You grew up having a whole set of types of reactions. And now when you go through life, if you see, hear, smell, taste, or touch something, or you, you think of a thought, even that thought comes up, uh, if it's um, about something that resembles something in the past, you have a, a library in there and you, your brain picks it out really quickly and you react instead of respond. So part of what this whole training is about is to learn to identify that really quickly and just let it go. Start noticing and you do react to something, then it, maybe when you go home, you review that in your mind. You say, when I did react, did I act to that essential thing that was going on or did I act in an unessential way to what was happening because it was so much like something that happened in the past. And that's what's happening to us. And we build up all this pressure and stuff inside our mind. And it really bothers us. Now, the future, it's not here yet, like I said. And so because it's not here yet, um, you know, there shouldn't be any pressure about that because there isn't any energy yet for that future. So what you're actually doing is, when we tell you this, usually I go like this and I say, see, the thing is, you have a cup of energy every day. And if you, how you spend that every day is entirely up to you. But if you give part of it away to the past and part of it away to the future, then you only have this much left up here, right here in this part here for the present. And so if you're tired at the end of the day, that's what's wearing you out. You didn't spend your daily energy quite the right way. And you can, once you understand this, then you, you tend to change the way you handle things once you see how this is all working. So that's why we spent time on this. So that's the first setup that we give you. The second one that I give you when you're learning to practice is I show you Okay, just take back here. And here's what it really looks like. You have avenue like this. You're in a chair like this. This is you. You are proud towards and loving kindness to a spiritual friend. There's your spiritual friend. Now, all of a sudden, something comes in your mind that stops you from sending or wishing that person happiness and you your mind's attention wanders away from here out towards something that's out here that is different than a normal thought so we make it look like a little puzzle piece like that okay but your your brain is firing off thoughts like this the whole time that you're practicing we are not supposed to be trying to stop our brain from doing anything it's firing tons of thoughts off, off. See, the brain isn't just about mindfulness. It's not just about thinking. It's about running the entire body and everything about you inside it has a lot of jobs to do. But every once in a while, something will pop up like this odd one that popped up, okay? And our attention will move over towards this, okay? Now, what's interesting is we think it's that this whatever it is, is pulling us away. It's not exactly true, but I'll tell you another day about that. I don't want to go into that right now. Basically, when you're pulled away like that, the question is, what do I do now? And when you are pulled away to here, you're obviously not thinking about your friend anymore. So you left them. So the question is whether, you know, usually when you're beginning with practicing twin, you don't realize that um, there are different levels of being pulled over here, but you just realize, oh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm not over here anymore. So I need to do something about this. And that's where the steps of the practice come in. 
where we say, once you realize you're not here anymore, what we want you to basically try doing is to just think in your mind real fast, never mind that, let go, relax, smile, and come back. This is it. Never mind, relax, let go, relax, smile, come back. Just let go, relax, smile, and come back. Now, you may have heard people call this the six R's. So if I told you in English, the six R's, <laughs> R's are there for English, but not for all other languages, it's kind of funny. But, but basically, every language has some, some kind of expression for just let it go. Whatever it is that's pulling your attention away from what you are supposed to be doing, just let it go. So when you're at work, when we take this into life, we say, never mind, I'm working here. I'm going to stay here in the present time. We're not demanding the present moment here. I want to be perfectly clear on this. There want no stress on the brain to try to be in the present moment. That will happen naturally. That is the part that will happen naturally as you invite the brain to start letting go and getting this new habit of letting go, relaxing, smiling, and coming back. So we don't want any stress. We don't want you to do as much as we want you to allow the evolution or the development of the practice. So now we talked about this. And so the steps for this were basically, um, basically to, to recognize that you're not with your spiritual friend. Then release the attention off of that. How do you release? It's just like holding a ball in the air and all you do is open your hand and let it drop out. That's the release step. There's nothing complicated about it. You just release the attention off of it and relax relax the uh, mind and then smile, relax, smile and come and re return, return. And you heard me say it a different way because the teenagers over here really got to me and they said, it's just simple to say, you know, just never mind. Like I, I, I recognize it and never mind it. And then let go, relax, smile, and come back. So you take it either way, you do it, do it the same way every single time. That is the only thing about this. If you're training your brain to learn how to spot the tension when you're pulled away and automatically do this, then to develop that, the way that you train your brain to do that, and it, it will learn, it really learns well, as long as you do it the same way. Oh, recognize, release, relax, smile, return again and again, and you repeat that. So the, the, the sixth step, when you talk about it being six R's, is just a repeat down here, okay? That's the other one, repeat. So this is the cycle of practicing TWIM. And what it's actually doing to you is getting you to a point where you don't just react and get tense and angry that you got pulled over to the hindrance. And so what we're talking about in the Bojanga Samyutta, Bojanga is about the seven enlightenment factors. And those are the most important things to come into balance at the time when you're in the deeper part of your meditation. And you're using these, all these pieces you are using in your practice from the day one when you start practicing. So we go over here and we just look at these for a minute, a little bit. Oops, a minute. So this is investigation is over here. And your investigation is the, uh, the, uh, the way, the, the pattern of what you are investigating, how things actually work. That's what you're doing. When we go and start with mindfulness, the mindfulness, our way of talking about mindfulness is an observation skill, a special kind of observation skill. And it can, has the potential to remind us to do, it take, reminds us to do these steps. It reminds us that if we are pulled away to do these steps, the six steps every single time. It reminds us that if we do get pulled away and we start doing them, also it reminds us to do all of them, not just part of them. Don't just let it go and come back. That doesn't work. It doesn't change anything in your life. Don't even uh, recognize and um, 
uh, just let go, come straight back or without relaxing and smiling. And somebody says, yeah, but when I release, I do relax. Actually, that's not real because even in the instructions for the Anapanasati, the breathing meditation, in those, those instructions, there's two pieces of tranquilize the bodily formation. And then another paragraph in the instructions is tranquilize the mental formation. So there's this tranquilization or relaxing any tension in the mind and the body that takes uh, starts to happen if you just do it regularly. And so when you let go, you've let go of the chunk, a chunk of it. But when you relax, you are letting go of the residual leftover amount. Very subtle there. Trust this because that really is there. And gradually you feel yourself drop down a little bit like deeper when you do the relaxed step every time. So why is that so important? Well, because when you're practicing, what you're interested in is you come to the meditation with tension and tightness, you want to relax. Where you're going is to experience the, um, the basic shutting down and coming out of it and opening of the mind. And when that is passing through what's called the cessation state, but to get to the cessation state, to get to any state at all, any one of the, any one of the, uh, the um, levels of understanding, to pass through any of the levels of understanding, which are the jhanas, okay, as you go along, conditions have to become just right for you to fall into the next one and just right to fall into the next one, like a waterfall that's coming down for the first time when the rain comes, it's dry and with, for the waterfall to come down eight levels, eight waterfalls, it has to come down and fill up and come down to the next one and fill up, come down to the next one and fill up. As it fills up, it's coming to the proper condition where it can fall down deeper and deeper. This is how we can say this is happening, a, a, a series of waterfalls coming down like that. But the conditions have to be right. So coming back here now, we come back over here and we say, so our mindfulness is observing and we're observing our spiritual friend. And then we are also during our practice, these are sort of components of the operation of your practice. We are investigating how exactly all phenomena comes into being, exists and passes away again and again and again, how this impersonal process is happening. We're investigating in order to see how everything works. This means if we're talking in Buddhist terminology, we're saying when we're investigating, we're trying to see for ourselves the Four Noble Truths, see how they actually work. So that would be, we want to be able to see suffering. Oops, let's see where I am here, oops. Oops, I'm not, am I? I'm not officially hooked in here. There we go. We need to, we want to see the suffering, how these things work. See the suffering. And we want, we're trying to see the cause of the suffering. Actually see the cause and break it down exactly what it is. And then we're trying to see what it's like if the suffering isn't there. What is it like for the cessation of suffering to exist? And so these three we're working with when we're talking about meditation a whole lot. And, the, and then the way or the path that takes us to this cessation. That's what we're trying to learn about. So we are trying to see that as we are doing our meditation. So that breaks down again to watching a rising phenomenon, noticing how they happen. You were just sitting there a while ago, you were just sitting here and you were watching your spiritual friend and then something came up that was different. You could just ignore all these little things that are happening around in the brain, but this one came up, you're pulled over towards it. And when you're pulled over towards that, away from your attention here, then you want to recognize you're here and you're not there. You want to let go of the, in, 
this one, take your attention off it, relax your head, smile and return, come back. That's what you want to do every single time it happens. So what, so what is good meditation and what is bad meditation in the process of your session? That's a good question. So you might have to do that 50 times and come to me and say, I had such a bad time of it. Actually, I had to do this 50 times in my session in an hour. And I would say to you, that's a good session because you had to see whether you could do it the same way each time, notice it and methodically do it the same time again and again and again. So that was a working session. You had to work at it in order for it to be accomplished. And if you came over and said that you had to do, you, you were interrupted 50 times, but you didn't do those steps, I would say that's a bad meditation because you weren't doing the steps properly. But you had the opportunity, if something kept happening that again and again, you had the opportunity to tap your brain again and again and again and again and again in order to train it. And this is important. Because once you get this practice going, about two months after 10 months time, it can flip and go automatic and start working for you perfectly. And you don't, you wonder what happened? I didn't even ask it to do these steps and it will just do it. That means that you were doing it properly and doing it the same each time and the brain was learning. And that's what happens. It just starts picking it up. So instead of reacting all of a sudden, you do start responding. So in other words, this is an interesting word. I had someone ask me about the word automatic this past week. And the word automatic can be a trap if we say this is such a wonderful meditation. It happens automatically. Is that true? No, that's not true. But eventually the brain goes on to automatic and starts doing it every time. That is true. Okay, but to come to it and expect it just to happen automatically is a mistake. You see what I'm saying about automatic here? So automatic, as teachers, we've got to be really careful if we say automatic. So in the description of the practice, we have to be very careful we don't write down that this is uh, really cool because it just happens, you start doing it, it happens automatically. Only if you don't change those steps. Does it get to the point and only if when you leave that retreat or you leave learning this, you do it every day and you carry it, not just sitting in meditation. I want you to sit in meditation once a day and maybe once in the morning, once at night, if you want to really make this work. Sure, I do. But I'm interested in whether you take it to the office with you and use it in every single in interaction that you have during the day. That is what really changes your life. When you put this thing to use, that's when it really pays off because of the amount you're training the brain and how fast it will change. Now look, here's your investigation. Now we know you're investigating this. You're learning to watch. Notice how the suffering happens maybe in the same way each time. You're learning that the cause turns out to be when I personally get involved in it too much, that's what happens, okay? You're beginning to see what happens if you don't get personally involved in it. And then you're having less atta and more anatta that is, is going on. More impersonally watching stuff instead of taking stuff personally. And this covers across the board of your life in everything that you do. It changes so that you see things more clearly than other people do. You grasp things going on more easily than they do because you are working with the essential of whatever's happening. Other people are working with, oh, that's just like what happened in the past and thinking about the future. This might not be so good. If you a way off course from where the conversation is supposed to be or what you are paying attention to. So the parts of this, let's go through these six real quick and then I'll show you how it works. So you're investigating it and you have to have a particular, a particular uh, energy level. You have to keep your energy up, but not too much and not too little. That's the energy that keeps you going longer and longer in your sitting meditation. People start uh, 
it with maybe a half hour, sometimes they leave a retreat at two or three hours. How'd that happen? Just start to figure out these pieces. This is one joy comes up. When joy comes up, that's wonderful. Piece of candy. Wonderful. Good job. But don't try to hold on to it because the joy coming up is a byproduct of how you're practicing correctly. And when it does come up, then it's there. You enjoy it and then let it go. Nobody says you can't enjoy it. What we're saying to you is don't cling to it. Don't hold on to it. Don't get caught by the desire of wanting it to happen again either. Because every time you sit, your sitting will be different. No, ever, things don't repeat. The Buddha talks about this in some places. Uh, so every time you sit, what I really want you to do is when you sit, you be sure that you sit with a two-year-old's mind. <laughs> What's a two-year-old's mind, he's saying? A two-year-old is just peeking around the corner just to see what happens next. They don't know what's going to happen next. It's a wonderful age. They're curious about everything because they're learning so much. So you stay curious and you sit just to see what happens next, no matter what level you're ever going through. Okay. Now, Joy, these three over here, um, I keep wanting to touch the screen because my old pen, I was touching the screen. I'm sorry. I'll do that again. Oops. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go back here. Okay. So the first one is you're, you're, it, you're sitting with the attention of good mindfulness and you're going to do your investigation, keep your energy up and you have joy. These three are, they have energy. These three have higher energy energy don't they on this side higher energy it takes your and so that makes you understand you've got to keep your energy up to have these functioning over here on this side it is a calmer energy it's calmer there's still some energy but this is calmer energy over here okay in this side so when joy fades away tranquility comes up okay and when tranquility uh, is going, that's the balance between joy and tranquility has to do with higher or lower amount of energy going on mentally energy and physical energy. Then collectedness is the next one. And the collectedness, this is your, this is your, uh, a trap for a lot of people. When you're starting with tranquil wisdom insight meditation, you've come from a place where they were talking about concentration and we this definitely is a form of concentration but it is a very it is uh let's say this it is retuned retuned or recalibrated recalibrated or you might say um it's reset and the best way is to go, I, I actually go back to the very first page of the Vasudhi Maga, believe it or not, about concentration. And people don't want to say, why are you talking about Vasudhi Maga? Well, I just read it to somebody today. And that, that's a really important page, okay? Uh, because what is there in that page, right? And it's so important that you would think that I marked it, but I still didn't mark it. That's really funny. Okay. It's the very first page. And th this is, he's beginning to talk about what he's going to talk about when it comes to meditation subject and everything. And in there, he's talking, uh, what is the concentration? What is this? In what sense is it concentration? What characteristic? What All this different stuff. How many kinds? Uh, and what is a defilement, like uh, a hindrance and stuff? What, it, what, what is the concentration helping you to cleanse? All these things are being, it's what's going to talk about. It's what he's going to talk about. But then how does he realize something? The first one is what is concentration? And he says, you know, concentration is of many sorts and various aspects involved in it. But uh, an answer to that attempts to cover it all would accomplish neither its intention nor its purpose and would besides lead to a distraction as well. 
And so we shall confine ourselves to the kind intended here, he means here in this book, calling concentration profitable unification of mind. Now, I really like this. Profitable, is it profitable? It means it's productive. And when I say productive, what do I mean? I mean, based on what the Buddha has said in other places, that good meditation is the one that takes you to the path easily and smoothly and, and supports you to go down it, to get to your uh, objective, okay? So when we say it's profitable unification of mind, it doesn't mean really, really tight. It means tight enough, but just so you can see everything clearly how it's operating. That's what it's talking about, profitable unification. It's saying profitable, and I like to say productive level of concentration or productive uh, level of collectedness, either way that you want to talk about it. So the concentration has to um, be able to allow you to see and understand everything. Well, why? Because the Buddha had a special way of teaching and he wanted his monks to learn specifically by seeing it for themselves. Seeing it for themselves means direct knowledge. That kind of direct knowledge is to uh, know something by seeing it. Knowledge and vision of how things actually work is talked about in the suttas. So this is what you're trying to do. Not too tight, not too loose, but just right. So you want this to be above all else um, profitable. Oops, I got, I lost my little thing again there. Okay. Um, my little pen. Okay. You want to be able to have a, a profitable, profitable level of concentration. There you go. That's what's real here. That's why we called it collectedness, because when we said that to the student, they would lighten up very well and things would be very productive. If we use the word concentration, they got down and they got ready to do it. Because <laughs> okay? that's how, what was the term I said? I just wrote a term. This is the problem is that when we're trying to teach this today, I came up with a term. We have a contrary cultural energy in this time, a contrary cultural energy to what they had in the Buddhist time. And what I'm talking about is the contrary cultural energy, our culture, our objectives, the amount of lust and greed and racing and everything to be the first one and all the rest of it, competition, heavy duty and all that is pressing us to work a lot harder than we actually have to to get where we're going a lot of times. And this is true in the, in the, in the meditation. The problem for the person with hindrances coming up and everything is happening sometimes because of the concentration level. So we need to really pay attention to how we're talking about these things, okay? And so the next one is equanimity. And the equanimity from the beginning, equanimity is a funny thing. Like we'll do this down here. Equanimity is happening at all different levels as you go along. And if I were to just show you what's happening, you're working with about eight stages of going down through this like this to the end, and when you get here, then what happens is you fall into cessation, and when you turn back on, up here something happens on the way. Up here, something happens here that opens up. That's where you rebooted, right in here. You rebooted and came back. When it turns back on, the brain is sort of been reset, sort of like a default setting like a child who's never had any pressure on them before in their mind. 
it's a remarkable experience what that is. So these first levels here, what is happening here? This is like, um, we say one, whoops, I did it again. I don't know why that turns off like that, but I'm probably touching a button on this somehow. What happened? I'm not sure what I did. Okay, here we go. You have your levels, one, two, three, four, rupa. You still feel, you still feel your body. Then you have um, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. That's what you're going through. That's what you're through. Now, what's interesting is that you don't have to, uh, you're supposed to be using your observation in all of these levels and you're not supposed to be pushing. And the deeper you go, the calmer it gets. So if I were to say to you, that equanimity, how much is here in the first shot? It takes that much. This is where I was glad I played dominoes when I was a kid. Yeah, I did that. Probably figure out what I'm doing by the end of this. I see, okay. So in second level, you have that many. In the third level, you have this many. In the first level, you have a very stable, four-pointed, uh, Four pointed activity, like very sturdy. If you were to say this is a creature, a creature, a three legged creature, even if this was a, um, you know, a triangle like that, it would still be able to fall down. But once you get it firm enough, like a square, a four legged animal, all of a sudden that's very, very steady and strong. And that's what you need to get over here into mental, mental realms. Okay. And we start losing our body right about here. We start losing it at the end of the third, into the fourth. You start losing feeling in your body. You go in your in mental, you're just watching what's happening next. Hard to do that sometimes if you were trying to control things a lot. All right. So what happened in the Samyutta Nikaya was the, this the Bojanga became very important because in order for you to fall here, right here, mm -hmm, right here in order for you to fall here like in right in this part here down to experience cessation you must have got you have to go through this last piece right here to go down there and in order to do that you have to not be there at all you have to not be trying to control anything you're just completely letting go you're just allowing everything to flow and you're not going to try to make anything happen at all when you empty out completely, you stand back and just watch this happens. And that's how that last piece happens. So what the Bojanga was about was it means that you have to bring all of these, all of these levels here, have to come into balance on the teeter-totter. That's what this is about, okay? It's about getting these levels to be absolutely you know, balanced so that you can just fall into the next level, which is this we're talking about cessation is the most important piece. So from day one, what I'm trying, the reason I built this this way to show you was from day one, really and truly, you are going to have to have a certain amount here and a certain amount here and a certain amount here, see? And build it level. It's going to this level these to get to this last one where everything slips eventually into balance. During the Rupa Jhanas and during the other part, you're going to be the one that's actually going to be going like this. It's like if you were in an old computer game and you had these seven pieces like the tips of my fingers, you'd be going watching them go like this 
And then finally, when they got there, you could go into another level. And you start playing again, and they're going like that while you're playing until finally they go like that, and they go, and you go into an. That's kind of what this is like. Visually, that's a picture of what this is like. So what keeps you from doing it is what we are talking about when we are talking about, um, about this, uh, about this, right? It's the piece that goes up here. I can't, how do I get back? Uh, Dama Gavesi, are you there? <laughs> hmm. Can't see how I get back to you guys now. Oh, wait a minute. There it is. Okay. Okay. I think I have to go like this to get back to you now. Okay. Now I can go even more. Yeah. Well, I know how I can do this. There you go. Hello. I can do it. I can. The grandma can do it. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. When we go into the Samyutta Nikaya, we read one last week, and the reason I brought you here is the one thing that's gonna keep you from going and getting to that point. Hindrances. Yeah, hindrances, distractions, disturbances, blockages, obstacles that turn into obstructions. So that's why it's so important that they had to write the Bojanga, because the Bojanga is the destination of this whole set of pages in the Bojanga is really talking about how it can stop the hindrances, how you can understand the hindrances and what makes them work. So if we understand the hindrance has a reason why it comes up. And the reason why it comes up is because you're interested in it. So if I put my personal attention on any hindrance that arises, and it's not just five hindrances, you know, if you go look around, I've said some things about that before also, but in some suttas, there are seven hindrances, some 11, some 14, some, some have as many as uh, 16. Uh, 128 is Upakalesa has 11 distinct ones. But what the Buddha was telling his monks always about the management of hindrances was always the same thing. He was always telling them the way to handle this is through abandonment. Now, abandonment, it doesn't take a lot to let go of something and relax and smile and come back. I mean, it's a lot better than you selling, you telling me, now listen, you, when this happens, you have to abandon it. And then you look at your son or you look at your daughter and you say, remember, you have to destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suppress it and subdue it and make it stop. Uh, but what did I just say? <laughs> I said that I would have to do that to the hindrance. Therefore, Atta, me, the Atta, would have to try to make it stop, but it won't stop. A very good uh, teacher gave an example of a beach ball floating in the water, and that's the hindrance. And you have to take it and make it go away. So what you would do is grab this beach ball and push it under the water. Now try to let go of it. It's just going to come up again. It's going to keep doing that again and again. Because every time that you try to grab it and push it down, it's not going to work. See, it's pop up again, pop up again. Yeah. So we have to simply let go. Never mind it. Let go, relax, smile, come back and stay with where we are. Don't give it the time of day is one expression. Now, I have told people if you really, if it pushes you and pushes you, and you know, it's a, it's trying to show you that this is the one thing that you have craving about. That is how it's a teacher. It's teaching you that this is the kind of craving you get into this kind of thing, but don't ever stop with it, talk with it, or give it, 
time of day. Don't get in a conversation with it because your job is to stay with your object of meditation. And the moment that you actually spend any time with it, and they do come, these the hindrances do come uninvited. They don't have invitations to come. So they'll show up and, you know, if you're really trying to do something at the office, say, okay, there's some tea, there's some cookies on the table, but I'm not going to come talk to you. So when you're finished, just leave, the, leave them alone and go, leave. I'm not gonna spend any time with you. After a while, they get the idea. Nobody's gonna feed me. I guess I'll just leave. And they start to fade away. This is what happens. So we don't have to fight with them. That's the big thing. I don't know when all this got turned around, but when I started to study hindrances more closely, there are a tremendous amount of suttas that are talking about this. And we go to Bojanga, we see this is what it's all about. So we, the last time we were here, we took the first one and we looked at that and it was talking a lot about the nutriment of it. And, um, I want to go to page 1573. And then, um, this is hard because they have to weave these all together. Well, let's just keep going. Okay. The second one in here, the first one we went through the Himalayas, right? The Himalayas. I don't think we did the second one. I, we do the second one is the nutriment for the hindrances and the nutriment for the enlightenment factors. Did we do this one last week? Can anybody tell me? Did we do it? Do you remember it, Paul? I don't know. All right. So we'll go through and use this one. This one is called the body. It's number two, and then parentheses in two. It's called the body. The first part of it's called the nutriment for the hindrances. So this is in the Bojanga Samyutta, page 1568. At Sawati monks, just as this body is sustained by nutriment, subsists independence on nutriment does not subsist without nutriment, so too the five hindrances sustained by nutriment subsist in dependence on nutriment. They do not subsist without nutriment. And what monks is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of the arisen sensual desire. There is, monks, the sign of the beautiful frequently giving careless attention to it is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of the arisen sensual desire. Now, this is interesting because when they talk about the beautiful and they're saying frequently giving careless attention to it, remember that phrase, frequently giving careless attention to it is a nutriment for the unarisen, more of it to come up and come up, okay? It doesn't mean that you are not to ever appreciate anything beautiful or never again smell a flower or never again smile when you see your child do something successfully, or you see something that makes you feel happy, you're not supposed to enjoy that. You can enjoy it as it's there, but remember, anicca means it's always going to pass away. The Buddha was basically pointing out, you must understand it's going to pass away, or you're going to suffer when it goes. So don't try to hold on to anything that is happening. You, this is about life flow, energy moving, living naturally through life. That is what this is all about. And so the nutriment 
for the unarisen sensual desire and the increase and expansion of that arisen sensual desire happens only if you start to hold on to it, you see? So then here it says, what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen ill will and for the increase and expansion of the arisen ill will? This is uh, versus lust and greed and hatred and aversion is the second one. There is the sign of the repulsive and frequently giving attention to it is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen ill will. So whenever you give attention to something that is unwholesome and you keep going in that direction, it will come to an increase and in expansion of this feeling of ill will and the negative stuff. So this is teaching you how it actually operates. So, I mean, this is 2,500 years ago. He's telling you that's what's going wrong. Okay, then what you need to do is you need to let go of it. Watch, we'll see what happens. So this is the nutriment for the hindrances to make them come up is to pay attention to them and feed them this nutriment. For the arising and the unarisen sloth and torpor, for the increase and expansion of it, there are monks discontent, lethargy, lazy stretching, drowsiness at meals, sluggishness of the mind, frequently giving careless attention to them. That is how you feed the sloth and torpor. And that is the nutriment for it, is for the, uh, in, for the ri rising of the unarisen sloth and torpor. And as you keep paying attention to it, it's for the increase and expansion of the sloth and torpor. Now, and what monks is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen restlessness, guilt, and remorse for the increase and expansion of this restlessness, guilt, and remorse. There is unsettled settledness of your mind and frequently giving attention, careless attention to it is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen restlessness, guilt, and remorse, and for the increase and expansion of arisen restlessness, guilt, and remorse. And then it says, the nutriment for the arising of unarisen doubt and for the increase and expansion of that, things that are the basis for doubt, frequently anything that you have doubt about in your life. You have doubt about the way you did something, doubt about the way you bring, you practice the meditation. If you feed this doubt, instead of just trying to just follow the instructions to long enough to see where they go, if you just do them and nothing else, then you will suffer because the nutriment for the unarisen doubt and for the increase and in expansion of it is when you give it careless attention, correct? And just as this body, sustained by nutriment and food subsists in dependence on its nutriment and does not subsist without the nutriment it is true of the five hindrances they are sustained by nutriment and subsist in the dependence on nutriment and they do not subsist without nutriment this is telling you something if you see how this operates explain clearly how it operates if you pay attention to it Sometimes you don't realize you're paying attention to it. I can't tell you how many times I have explained this to a group and then the same person will come and still say right back to me after I say it to them in an interview, another way. They'll say it another way, but they don't even hear themselves doing that. It's out of just habitual uh, tendency to be handling it another way. That's all it is. But now you're coming up into this, um, this other reality where you're trying to learn exactly how things work and then what you want to do, once you know how it works, is you can fix it. You know, you can't fix it unless you know how it works. Can't fix the bike when it breaks down unless you know how it's broken. This goes on many old sayings in every language we have this, okay? So the next section on this is the nutriments for the enlightenment factors specifically. 
just as this body sustained by nutriment subsists in dependence on nutriment and does not subsist without nutriment. So too the seven factors of enlightenment sustained by nutriment subsist in dependence on their nutriment and do not subsist without their nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the um, enlightenment factors? For the fulfillment and development of those enlightenment factors, and things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor, frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness and for the fulfillment and development of the arisen factor of mindfulness. Correctly, you are giving your attention properly. In the practice of the loving kindness meditation, it would be sending to your spiritual friend. That's where your mindfulness should lie. And if you pull away, to do the steps precisely to let go, relax, smile, and come back. back. The next one. And what, monks, is the nutriment for the arising of the un, of the un arisen enlightenment factor of investigation of state for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of the uh, investigation of states. There are amongst wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright states with their counterparts frequently giving attention to them as the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of the investigation of states. So to feed that investigation of states, whenever you have a blamable and blameless state, you choose a blameless state and just simply go up with the blameless state, wholesome and unwholesome state, you stay with the wholesome and you, then you get to a balance of either wholesome or unwholesome and where they are just balance of them and you investigate them evenly, equally, without getting upset about them, just examining them. This is what your investigation part is all about to note the nature of a dark state, the nature of a bright state, the nature of the inferior state, and the nature of the superior state, as the counterparts as they go along. And what monks is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of energy? You watch your energy balance, your, uh, your energy levels. There are the element of the arousal, the element of the endeavor, and the element of exertion. They're taking it to three parts, raising up your level of your energy, and then carrying through the endeavor of your practice on that energy, and the level of exertion you put into it, that's all. Not too much, not too little. That's the balancing point there. Frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of energy. And what? monks is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of joy for the fulfillment of development of the arisen factor of joy things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of joy and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of joy. Joy is a very interesting thing. If somebody says, don't 
They'll say, don't be attached to your joy. That's absolutely right. Don't get into your joy. That's absolutely right too. But when joy's there, use it, have it, and always be aware of all of the teachings around joy. Whatever arises as a state is arising, is there, and will pass away. Fine. Enjoy it. Don't get attached to it is correct. But when someone just says that don't get attached and doesn't explain anything else, then people walk away thinking, I can never again smile. I'm a Buddhist now. I should only be like this. And that's it. That's it. No. That's not true. I know many Buddhist people who smile. Many Buddhist people who are happy. That's not true. But just be sure you understand that we go up and up, up, we go down and down, down. We go over here and we go all around. But wherever we go, there we are, and there it is, and then it's gone because of Anicca. If long as we understand how this is working, it won't be nearly so upset to have things arise and be there and pass away. One of the problems in our world today are how many books are written about getting happiness winning happiness creating happiness sometimes is okay you got to read the whole book to find out um the way to happiness could be okay but the reason i'm saying it that way is happiness is a great thing but as soon as you want me to put that happiness in a box and sell it to you I can't do that. Why? We fixate in our cultures universally amongst human beings today to believe that everything we really like and want is so simple. It could be in a box and we could just buy it and have it. When in fact, happiness is a byproduct, not a product. So how can you put the byproduct of in, in a box? You can't put the byproduct there unless you have the product. And the product, the, it's a byproduct of the way that we live. That is happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of the way we live. Therefore, I can't sell you the happiness. However, the Buddha did have a path to happiness. The Eightfold Path was the way that we live to lead to happiness. And still, though, happiness is a state, so the sukha will arise and be there and pass away. So in other words, once you know it all works this way, relax, relax, relax. Let go because you have to see that things in front of you are like a movie and it'll all play out. You do the best you can and take your part in going the direction you'd like it to go. But always remember, if that's not where it ends up, Anicca will change everything at that point. Things keep changing. That's what we have to get used to, understanding the reality of this natural law. And what, monks, is the nutriment for the arising or the unenlightenment factor uh, uh, of the uh, unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility? for the fulfillment and development of this factor. Ah, to practice tranquility of the body, tranquility of the mind, to have times when you're spending alone and you are totally, completely tranquil. And the more you practice that way, it will help you in equanimity not to react so often in life. And so we practice that. That's part of what our practice of meditation is for, our walking meditation, remembering this beautiful tapestry of pieces of information the Buddha gave and how they're all attached together. They're all interwoven. That's why we can't learn Buddhism from one sutta and say, this is it and that's all we need. It's not, it's not real. There are many factors and pieces to it to make it so that that seems like that's the best way. Sure, you could say that about this sutta or that sutta for this purpose or that purpose. 
but you need the pieces clearly to understand the words. And I was going to tell you all next week, I'd really like very much if we could get as many people as possible to come into next Wednesday. And when we do our uh, lesson, then we have people bring in what happened to them when they were starting their meditation. What did they run into that stopped it from working? And let's look at those things closely. Everyone has a story about what did you run into first? What happened to you as you were trying to practice smoothly? We need to share these things and talk about them openly, what it was that we faced and if we have a solution, what it is that we used for the solution, but did we see how it was really operating? We need to practice this. So frequently giving attention to tranquility of the body and tranquility of the mind, that's a nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility. And so there are some total relaxation exercises. They're feeding that for people, lying down and doing total complete relaxation of the entire body, learning about your body. If you have not been athletics inclined, or dance inclined, or you know some type of activity where you were in touch with your body before, this is a very good thing to do. When you get a dancer to come, or someone who was a swimmer, or a athletics person who had more close work with their body, sometimes they'll do much better with your meditation. But everybody can develop this by doing certain things about your body, like Qigong and some of the uh, Ping Shui, even just movements of the body in the swinging exercises in Ping Shui are enough to get the feeling of your body and understand, be in touch with that. And these things take you to the fulfillment of the development of the arisen enlightenment factor of tranquility. Then we get to the next one is what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of concentration and for the fulfillment of by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of concentration. There are the sign of serenity, the sign of non-dispersal. Non-dispersal is the mind is able to just watch and not disperse over the place. Non-dispersal. Frequently giving attention to this is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factors of concentration or collectiveness for the fulfillment and development of the develop of the factor of collectedness to the right degree. And that's how we have ways of practicing this and then using it in our life. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of equanimity and for its fulfillment of that factor of equanimity and the things for the basis of equanimity, the factor of equanimity, frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of equanimity for the fulfillment and development of the arisen, arisen uh, enlightenment factor of equanimity. Now, equanimity is balanced mind. And I did a chart one time, and the student came later to me, and they said, we've had been working on this, as I told you, like one level, like a one-legged animal and a two-legged animal can still fall down. And and the third three, the tripod can still fall down. The, the three points like this can still fall fall down like a, a tripod for a camera. And, um, and the four-footed one is the best one because the four-footed one, when you have the, um, the four-footed one, then all of a sudden the four feet that are there are really strong and sturdy. And that's what you need for the mental development. So just as the body is sustained by nutriment, subsists in dependence on nutriment, does not subsist without nutriment. So you see now that these seven factors of enlightenment sustained by nutriment 
subsist in dependence on nutriment, do not subsist without nutriment. So saying when you're taking a walk and you think through your mind, you learn these seven and you learn them by heart. They're not hard. You just make that little drawing of the seesaw. So you have this mindfulness. And then on this side, investigation, energy, and joy. On the other side, when joy fades away, then all of a sudden there's tranquility and it goes down a little bit here. And then what's happening is this is going like this when you're learning to practice. It's going up and down like this. And gradually you will get it. So it's just like this and it will fall into cessation. So throw open the floor. Any questions about what we're talking about tonight, what we're talking about with this and um, with the nutriment and understanding how it works and why the six uh, steps or the, uh, the uh, right effort is so important is because it allows you to shift and work with these different pieces and keep them level. Not get mad at yourself. If you've a lot of this, don't get angry. If not, don't get angry. <laughs> Just start balancing it and keep practicing balancing it. I mean, you know, sometimes I used to get mad at my sister would put me on a teeter totter. She was much bigger than me. And she always, she, I annoyed her when I was little a lot, you know, because she was older and a, a teenager at that time, 10 years older than me. And she'd say, get me out of the way, get me out of the way. She put me in a teeter-totter. She'd bump me like that, you know. <laughs> Be nice to the person on the teeter-totter. Whichever it is, just remember you have a little bit down, a little bit up, until you get these things balanced out. So that's the story of the nutriment for the enlightenment factors. And then there are these other discussions in here, which are all sort of talking about what we do about these and how... Um, how they operate. So if you have time to read them, dive in and take a listen. And I'll throw it open to talk to some to some questions. Anybody? I see you, Polton is here. I see Sarah's here. Hi. I haven't seen you guys. I hope you're okay. <laughs> Yes. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay, we've been having trouble uh, with the technology. Okay. Treat it on mine. Yeah. Okay. Totally balanced. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a couple of uh, uh, questions if uh, if you have time. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in the in the uh, sort of you were just reading, <clears throat> there are a couple yeah. of uh, times when um, uh, it says uh, that the the way you counteract things is that you um, concentrate on, for instance, what is the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy? Um, so my question is, what is the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy? I can understand the balancing of the Bajangas, but if joy isn't present, or if, um, uh, uh, so the feeling of sukkah maybe isn't present, what is the basis? Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I'm trying to find what is the basis, what is the nutriment was the question. Uh, let me just get the sutta. Um, so are you, are you, uh, on, if, are you, are you looking at the Samyutta Nikaya? Yes, I'm looking, uh, yes, I'm looking at the Bojanga Samyutta, it's on page... 1568, page 1568. I'm looking at page 1570. Oh, we're in another sutra, probably. No, no, no. Oh, okay, okay. Where is that? Where is the basis? And it says, and what because is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of rapture or joy, and okay. the by the development of the unarisen uh, factor. There are because things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy, frequently giving attention to them. Okay. So my question is, what are the things? that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy. What, is, what are the things that are the basis for, okay, 
when we start, when you, when you start practicing, you have to, um, bringing your mind, bringing your, uh, what am I trying to say? Basis, 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 basis. Well, factors, your factors for the for factor of um, the nutriment, which will bring about the arising of it. And the yeah. nutriment for the arising of it, that is the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy. So the nutriment freak is frequently giving attention to the um, to those things is the is the uh, is the nutriment for the arising of the uh, enlightenment factor of joy. So the uh, atten careful attention to your, uh, to your elements, the, the basis, basic things for your meditation, right? So your concentration, your, your mindfulness, your observation, those things of observing everything and not letting anything else come in the way. So you're where I said that you were sitting in your avenue and you're sitting here and you're working yep. here is staying in there. That's how it comes about. Okay, doing so- Doing nothing else, doing nothing else. And let it, this, is, this is how it, it brings about, that's how it brings about the, um, for the, yeah, for the enlightenment factor. So you would see what happens when, what brings about the, uh, the, um, hindrances is when you pay attention to the hindrances so if mm -hmm. we go back to the other section you would see that the hit they always put the, the the nutriment for the hindrances first and then the nutriment for the enlightenment factors so the nutriment for the hindrances what's happening is you're paying attention to them and you're making them bigger and as soon as you you give the um uh nutriment for the unarisen um hindrance and for the expansion of that arisen hindrance would be giving careless attention to it which is the nutriment you see yep. so how does joy arise joy arises when you stop you're, you're just paying attention you're just using your object of meditation correctly so okay. would i be right in saying then that the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy is the uh, non-feeding of hindrances careless attention to them yeah. and the yeah. joy and that's what it says here in the other one it says it says uh it's using the careful attention to uh to those to those things which are the basis which was not attention careful attention to non-attention got it yeah because that, uh, that's that's where it's going careful attention to non-attention you see, I was too in... much attention, too much attention on the hindrances is getting them nutriment. So careful attention on non-attention, which what, now let's boil that down a little farther. You're sitting in a chair in front of you is your spiritual friend, like I was doing a little drawing, and you're just using the object of meditation correctly. That's important to understand. It's like, this is what I'm saying about these pieces, you know, they're all over the place. And, and this is why we, at that one retreat we went to where we had to come up with the laws of meditation because we were saying there's all these little pieces and one of the pieces about it is what is the object of meditation for why do we have an object of meditation in any meditation you have to know that i can't just talk to you about the basis one of the basis pieces here is what is your object of meditation and what is it for you don't pay attention to your uh, object of meditation like I have to hold on to that. All it really is is an anchor for the sailboat so it doesn't float away when you're spending the night in it in a cove. You put the anchor down, it holds the boat so it won't float away. That's all it's for, but you can't hold on to it. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, while I was listening to both of you speaking, what, what came up in my mind was whether we can look at this. Um, an, another way around and and suggest that the basis for joy could be generosity so 
I'm thinking this from two two angles. One well, is see that, okay. Well, you're now you're backing up. Really now you're backing up to really another thing. set of pieces. See, that's what I'm talking about. If you're if you know when that's why we don't start by studying this book. It's another reason, <laughs> you know, because we have to have uh, Donna Sila Bhavana first. Mm -hmm. So the basis for joy arising. Let's look at it from that perspective. Okay, is that your Donna is functioning? Your Sila is in place. You're sitting there and you're not thinking about anything else. At that point, we're using our object of meditation correctly as a, you know, so you stay right here working with this. And then all of a sudden, conditions become right, don't they? And suddenly, joy arises. Remember that experience with uplifted joy? And it's the same thing later when the when this element, the um Enlightenment factor of joy is just a deeper version of that. But same thing, conditions have to become right. And I know uh, Hugh would say, what conditions? And there we go back to Donna, Sila, that bhavana in place, feeding it. So you're both correct. Is and there more? Thinking, yeah, because if you're not feeding, this is at a very simplistic level, but if you're not feeding your hindr these hindrances, this is a real act of generosity to yourself. But uh, the other the other aspect that That's I was true. I was That's thinking true. of is looking at these in terms of your daily life. Um, and I was just reminded that actually it's when when you are generous in daily life, but I don't necessarily mean a physical gift, but it might be a um, just a, 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 a sure. connection, being really happy for somebody else. The sympath that's what brings up that sympathetic joy. So it's a generosity of spirit there that is um, bringing, that I thought would, would be connected with the joy. You can do it that way. You can do it that way. But see, that's why I'm saying, I think what, what sometimes I sit around and I think, why, why doesn't it work more smoothly with, other uh, angles, other kinds of um, meditation. When I look at how we're teaching this and trying to help teachers learn how to teach it, um, you have to be real careful. You don't get too scattered away from it because there's so many pieces. You have to be careful. Um, uh, because we go back when I, I want to say how, why, when I was building the first booklet for helping people in retreats, and had to show you what is meditation. And we had to say again, what is concentration? And we had to say again, what was the purpose of doing the meditation? This is the meditation. This is the mindfulness. This is how we're doing it and everything, why we're doing it to see and understand how everything actually works. Then we go into the other subjects and, and we start with Dana Sila Bhavana, the old fashioned way. And I think I may have told you, I thought, I wasn't sure, I felt like, it's real obscure. We never hear about that anymore. We only hear Sila Samadhi Panya. We don't hear, um, we don't hear. And that's when the guy called me from, Cal, uh, from Canada that time. And he said, why? I needed to call you. Why are you set, teaching these people this thing, Donna Sila Bhavan? And no one else is doing that. They're only talking about Sila Samadhi Panya. And I, I had to take him back and show him and prove to him these were in all of the old Sunday school books, all of the original way of doing this, and that this was the basis for meditation when you came in in Sri Lanka to go back and try to explain to him this is real. So that the generosity, your heart, if you have a locked up heart, do you think joy is going to arrive? So you hit the nail you, the, the, right on the head the right way when you said Donna. You see, generosity, the perp, what's the purpose of generosity? The dana to open to soften and prepare the heart for proper functioning in the meditation for softening and opening the heart more and sometimes you talk to people about, about like a group what's happened to the people in the ukraine i bet you they don't want to have joy come up real easily right now a lot of them don't having gone through all that and I've met people that were caught from World War II or some of the other wars that happened that hadn't felt any joy in years and years. And we had to work with them to get them to a place where when this joy came, sitting there with tears running on their face. And I thought, what's wrong? 
No, it was just joy. And I said, did what happen? He hadn't felt any joy in six or seven or eight years at all. The way they deal with the crisis was to shut up. Holding in arms isn't here in these places where there's a lot of work. People sit on you like this with their arms locked up because they need their heart. They're just, that's why I'm oh, arms up. Open your arms and put them down on your lap and, and hear what's being said. You can't take it in. You're just surface hearing. You can't really take it in. So all these little pieces that are annoying and some, some people want to just run away from them until we figure out they have a causal piece, a causal piece, a causal piece. And we learn about dependent origination. One time we turn around, we go back through all the stuff I told you in the beginning and you begin to see that Donna had a basis for getting you to do the sila, wanting to do the sila and keep it. And the sila had a basis for helping you get through the hindrances when you're practicing, yeah? And made the ground ripe, like it preparing the bumi, they call it. The bumi is the, the, the prepared soil for this whole thing to happen. And then you practice and you start to move correctly. So you guys are right. I mean, that's right. Both of you are right in tapping into what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was very interested in the, in the sutta here when we're talking about the nutrients, the enlightenment factors. Uh, that some, uh, some of them, like for investigation, there's a whole description there of working with the opposites. Um, where the enlightenment factor of energy, there's a description of arousal, endeavor, exertion. Uh, when there's a de description of tranquility, there's a description of the tranquility of the body and tranquility of the mind. Yeah. But with joy and with um, equanimity, it simply says... Um, uh, no, um, yes, an equanimity, uh, the basis of, for the enlightenment factor of equanimity. It's, it's just as opaque, if you like, as the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy. So you were describing, I think, as part when you were going through, the basis for the enlightenment factor of equanimity was a, a balanced mind. Um, is there anything else you can say around that? What is the process, perhaps, of cultivating um, that uh, balance of mind. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Um, having generosity flow, um, generosity working in your life. Uh, and, and Sarah's quite right. Um, you can be in an office where somebody's really ridiculing somebody or they're being mean to them and, and just having your mind in a position where you're not going to accept that and maybe saying something to support the person one time a day, you know, when everybody else is against them. They have no reason to be against them. Not sure what's really going on, but um, generosity feel better self, but you're giving to that person and supporting them. And, you know, equanimity is a balancing factor. So when we're talking about equanimity, we have to look at it's it's a give it's a a gradual thing that happens and and I was reading something the other day and um, it's you don't quite know how to explain equanimity except the story that I told you the, the experience of real equanimity versus somebody saying equanimity and it's just they're not really talking about it and they're usually if they're not talking about it it's because they haven't experienced it. And where you, where you know when you're talking about equanimity as it actually is, is what happened to me in the truck that time. When I got into the pickup truck at the top of the mountain to go down and get the milk, it's a six mile drive down that mountain and it started to rain. And then when I turned the curve and I had to go down a thing real steep like this and then turn really sharp right and, a real, and go around a big rock that was sticking out that could hit the truck and then go around and on the edge beside me was this big drop into the river. Yeah, well then the brakes didn't work at the top. And try, try, I, I didn't even think about it. I had been, the reason it happened, I discussed it with Bonte, but how did it happen? Because I wanted to understand like, how is this happening? It's because you did already were sitting in it. There was a residual from you sitting in it for a couple hours in meditation and then being asked to do this, it was still there. And you, and you just got in the truck and went. 
but there the problem is what was it that happened was at the bottom by any stretch of your imagination after pumping the the brakes to try to get them to work and but getting down and then getting the bottom and finally they took hold and i was this far away from hitting the cliff when it stopped and and then sitting there thinking now it's going to hit me now my stomach is just going to grab my heart's probably going like this and i took my pulse and it was 59. Mm -hmm. how can that happen it was 59 and my stomach was perfectly all right and my muscles were totally relaxed how come i wasn't uptight when that happened that was real equanimity. And then the fact that uh, I went to the store after that, I turned and went up through, the, we call it the chute, where the, the trees are just like this and you have to go through 28 trees that are just almost wide as your truck. You have to drive through there and across the river and to the little store to get this milk for these college students. And then I turned around and came back and driving up the mountain, I started to think, I, why didn't Bonte explain this? <laughs> and when I got to the top of the mountain, I went and knocked on the door and he came to the door and said, what's up? And I told him what happened. I said, so why didn't you explain this equanimity to us? I was so angry at him. Why didn't you tell us what this was? And then he said, honestly, you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I said, why? And he said, because it's gone now. <laughs> it's, it's gone. You're, you're just right there like this. And he said, it's gone. I said, oh, it is. <laughs> this is Nietzsche. It's just gone away, just wasted away. So these things, learning how to experience them, this, this equanimity thing, that was real, honest to goodness equanimity. But people would say uh, that's just kind of a um, ha happy feeling. I forget what it was. The woman that we went to listen, they were going to explain equanimity, but actually, it wasn't equanimity, it was, um, what do you call it, pleasant, painful, it was neither pleasant nor painful feeling was equanimity. And that's not true. That's not, it's not the same thing at all. So um, I don't ever want to have that discussion, by the way, but we used to tell Bonte, one of these days, we're going to force you to tell us what neither painful nor pleasant feeling is. And I'll give you a hint, it's not neutral. <laughs> and it takes a long time to discuss it. And he actually spent like 30 minutes or so trying to discuss and we looked at his face and we knew that most of us couldn't get what he was trying to explain. We, there were six or seven of us there. Um, it's a very strange phenomenon. <laughs> and then you go back in the text fishing around to see where that sits. But neutral is not quite the same thing as neither pleasant nor painful feeling. It's different. So this equanimity is something that you build. And I just want to say that this is here, but I'm not sure if it is. Wait a minute. It's not, it's not here. I don't even know where it is anymore. That's dangerous. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry, I have to go, but thank you so much. Yeah. You still the, stay. I've just got to collect my daughter. So, okay. Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll let you all go because it's like 11. Does anyone else have a question? But does that answer your question, you sort of? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, you know, it's like like all these things, it's a bit like the skin of an onion. You think you've got the idea of it and then you come along and, and there's another thing. The only other thing I wanted to quickly mention was you were talking about happiness and how there's a sort of predominance now of, of people sort of aiming for happiness. Um, yeah. I like the way you described that it being a byproduct of the, of the way we are with, through this practice of TWIM. And it strikes me that the, what happiness is, is, is the absence of craving, it's the absence of desire. So it's not a thing itself, it's an absence of something. Um, and so when we try and aim for an absence of something, we're always going to miss. Mm. Yeah. I said it's a byproduct of the way we live. Um, well, I think the way, the way we yeah. live is the consequence of the way we practice. Yes. The problem is if you start reading some of these books about happiness, uh, it's wanting happiness, having to have happiness, having to hold happiness all the time there is not well, very if real. It, I, I, I did find it very helpful to think of it as the absence of something. And if it's the absence of something, we can't hold it. 
it's just um uh what was i thinking the other day um there are states and then there are the colorings of states or you know well when we talk about quiet mind for instance when you're in quiet mind then we'll say the person comes back and says i'm sitting in equanimity are you i thought you were sitting in quiet mind with equanimity quiet mind with bright mind quiet mind with this or with that so these things were you know color colorings of this piece of a quiet mind and happiness is like um a shading on life and this, uh, I heard that saying of it's a byproduct one time, but I can't remember the speaker. I, I don't think it was Tony Robbins, but somebody like that, something, it could have been Tony Robbins, but, and he said it and it was stuck with me for a long time. It's a byproduct. Why are we trying to get happiness? when it's a byproduct of the way we live. So if we were living in the living the eightfold path the way the Buddha was intending for us to living, we would, you see, you don't attain happiness, you would experience happiness yeah. with the path I, I when agree. it's operating. I yeah. Because I, I think I think the expression of the eightfold path is is to be uh, to be in balance around craving. Yes. And if you're in balance around craving, then you get happy. Exactly. And if you're if you're learning to stay more in the present time, you get happy. And if you call Dhamma Gavesi, he'll tell me if I'm not on there, he'll say, come down to earth, sister. <laughs> we can't I'm know. wondering, uh, uh, I do have so happy birthday. Tomorrow uh, you have uh, your birthday, 28th. Oh. <laughs> in advance, what? we can wish uh, Sister Keva her birthday. Ah, well, okay. Indeed, happy birthday, Sister. Oh. I do, so I do. So we're up to 72. So this year I'm seven plus two. That's nine years old. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I uh, guess my no, birthday. No, 73. Yeah, yeah. You will complete 73. You no, 72. Is, se am, is it 73? Nineteen, nineteen. Oh, <laughs> Did I forget one year? Really? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I I thought it was I thought it was seventy two. It's two thousand and twenty two. Oh, look at that! Oh my gosh! So, <laughs> So Goa really did cheat. Well, so that means I must have already been nine. So now I'm going to be ten, which is one, one year, one <laughs> year old. <again. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have. This is like. This is what we do, by the way, for anybody that's watching. What we do is we forget about age, and we just kind of take the two numbers when they show up and add them into a single number, and then we take that number and have fun. <laughs> So I guess I, I've, been, I've been telling everybody I was 72 this year, so I'm 73. You were 72 this year. You are 72. <laughs> well, I guess I, I would have had my birthday at uh, Noah. Is that right? We would have yeah. to me. Having that is one the last year for everybody. <laughs> I don't know. Tomorrow, uh, I know cake. people tell me uh, what happened. Uh, what did you do? <laughs> so this time, I'm going on a trip, and I heard that I heard um, that uh, Hugh was asking, like, what should you do next or something? You're trying. So if you want to, you can come over to Gdansk and visit me because I'm going to Poland to leave here, just to go out to Poland, where I've been invited to do a series of small retreats, very small. And these um, 10 person, six, eight person, 10 person retreats, people are coming in to do these retreats. And a lot of these people are business people or people who, um, people who uh, uh, you know, have been working with a set of coaches and they're international coaching people. And, uh, and one of them was, uh, I was really interested in, in this, what he was doing. And we got to talking, which is exactly what I always wanted to be involved in sharing this this way, you know, where you want to affect people. You're always looking for ways to affect a lot of people. And one time I did something with someone else that I was working on something. We were trying to 
affect a whole country. And, and I won't tell you what it was about. It was just about a peace movement thing, but we had this presentation and no one would listen to it. And I was in Washington, DC and, um, and she said, she came and convinced me to give these talks up and down the Eastern seaboard at the time, up and down the Eastern, Eastern coast of the US. And um, I wasn't, but she and I sat at lunch and said, but how can we really get to the people we wanna to get to these senators and these representatives to get them to listen to this and take this and read it as they're listening to it, et cetera. And we couldn't do it. And I got, cited and written up in the journal for her PhD work on this in the end as uh, the woman who got to the right people through pillow talk. And what had happened was I gave up trying to reach the senators themselves and started to work on reaching the wives. And the wives took the little tape and the package home and some of them actually did listen and we we made some headway with that. But the the idea was I had this obscure way of we were not going to go directly to reach these people. It's just not going to work. And um, so this I got written up for pillow talk. <laughs> my my claim to fame at Columbia University in the Department of Political Science and, and stuff. That's what happened. That's where it was written up. So <laughs> that was a very funny escapade going through that time. So sometimes uh, we can accomplish things by doing them in an odd way. And what we've been struggling for a great deal over here at this time in the world, it's not easy to even raise pennies, let alone enough money to build anything. And, and if we're going to build a center and actually have one here that it can be a, a center that's paid for to go the, the avenue of grants in India is like, you're looking at 12 or 15 years for your building to come up, you see, because each one of those installments for what they agree to give you is going to <laughs> go through their system of, of, of how they operate things. I'm trying to be polite, <laughs> you know, and you're not going to maybe get the same amount of money at the end. And then when you get it, it takes a long time to get each installment to build things. So you see lots of places all over India being partially built and sitting there, but not finished. And I, I'm not that young that I want to spend another 10 or 12 years to get a building in place. So I was trying to get people to agree to buy a warehouse and rebuild it. And they didn't turn on much about that. <laughs> But then someone suggested to me because of the work that they're doing, why don't I, why don't they let me come with them over there and help me do their work by teaching them what I taught this person. And it seems that TWIM in the last year, the last 12 months, I have figured out TWIM honestly is something that is easy enough for you to share with another person and have them practicing for a month or two and have it turn into automatic in their life. And I, by discovering what happened in this situation by teaching this student who taught two of his clients and now the clients are developing, you know, like by having support calls once a week to them only. And so we've got it down to a fine point of the pieces that you need to know and stick with precisely. The people that are working with this coach are paying a lot of money to be coached. So if he's telling them you have to do this, they're going to do it because they're paying a lot of money to learn how to do the things he's asking them to do to straighten out their life for better business policies, better working with customers, better interactions with people and everything. The way that this person started coaching was, it was a case of um, extreme shyness. That's what it was. And he broke through his shyness by having someone help him. And then he got interested in it. Now it's the life work of his to work with people who want to break out and not just be locked up at home working on computers, but come out more in the, the work they do with online people. They want more interaction with human beings and they want to have more skills. That's how, that's how he got started. And apparently TWIM is a real opener for opening people up 
and helping them to go back and work with people. And our minds are, are similar on this. So I got invited to do this and I, I was sitting, I told him directly on the phone the other night, I said, this is one of the fastest uh, manifestations I've ever pulled off because I was sitting here with wet towels and ice on my head in a room where the air conditioner turns out the air conditioner was broken and it was 43 centigrade. That's 111 degrees all day long and into the night. Nothing, it doesn't go away. So if you, even if you lie absolutely still, of course, remember, this is only me. The other 4,000 people in front of me when I gave a speech last week to 4,000 people, they're all, I'm looking at their faces and no Indian person is perspiring at all. But me, I'm just pouring off my body, you know, just so for Westerners, this place is not a place to be. That's all I'm going to say so for <laughs> April and May, probably April and May. Now, if you're young, maybe you could take it and maybe I could have too. But obviously, well, I'm young. I'm one. But my body says otherwise. <laughs> now I'm one year old. My body is saying something else. And it's one of these things about growing older, the frustrating day that you wake up with plans to just get up and go. And uh, but your body didn't get didn't uh, it didn't it got up and went it didn't happen <laughs> you know your your mind was all ready to get up and go and your body said whoa 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 wait a second let's discuss this <laughs> you know and this is what 70s apparently is was the marker was more or less like 69 70 I think was really the marker for this really is earnestly beginning to happen. I spoke to a friend in the United States. She said, yeah, at that age, I went to a geriatric psychologist. She fell down once and they put her through this geriatric psychologist. And then she just was really watching it all the time and more comfortable with it. But with me, I'm like, I want to keep going, you know, and I'm not in one place. I, I can't, I've been in this one place, you know, actually been in this one place longer than I expected to be able to stay. But um, this, this time, this is really hard this time. So uh, it was only when I say it was a good manifestation, I thought of it the day before, um, two days before the end of the retreat. I didn't know who he retreat that I did online. And going over the results of what happened and hearing him tell me he had shared it with one person, then finding out I could follow up with that person. And months after he starts with just the instructions from him, he's already in the uh, level where he's doing the other people in the directions. And he's already very, very happy having discovered he could even feel joy come up no more depression and much higher grades at school. And he's going to graduate the end of May. So it's not complicated if you can follow the directions we give you. That's where the trick to all of this is. So we should say our prayer. And next week, uh, remember, spat, pass the word because who, however you can get to come to this thing, I really want to build this from now till next week. I want to get a lot of people here to hear about the problems you have when you first start retreats or when you're teaching somebody TWIM, what are the difficulties you face in the first three days of your retreat? That's what I want to hear about. Because I think I've uncovered a lot of stuff, but I want to hear now from everybody I can hear from, what are, you, what are the difficulties for you getting the person going very smoothly with this? and then try to help you see if I can sense what it is that's happening and help you um, notice something that I'm noticing or something. Let me pick up on it, you see? Because uh, there, there are just some points where we have to be really strict about how we explain things, but we can't de apparently we can't deviate away from them. We just can't. Like that word I told you earlier, I think I told you what it was. Um, automatic, that word. If we don't say what it means and then this person goes off and thinks, well, I'm just gonna practice, it'll come automatically. And, it, and then it didn't, <laughs> you know? And I'm there, well, that's the wrong meaning for automatic with us. Okay, so here we go with prayer and sign off. 
May suffering once be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.